Hello everyone, David Ansardi, and I am going to do your next lecture for Unit 1 here in Biology 202, which will be about leukocytes, which is another term for your white blood cells, and we'll also talk a little bit about leukocyte disorders. All right, so let's get started here. Now you've already heard by this point um, about the different components of your blood and you've probably also seen this diagram from your textbook where you know when you have blood drawn a lot of times it's taken over to the laboratory and they spin it in a centrifuge and that helps separate out the major blood components from each other based on how fast they settle um, in a centrifuge when it's spinning and you would find that your red blood cells or your erythrocytes would end up in the bottom of the tube because they're more dense um, up at the top of the tube, you would have the liquid component of the blood or your plasma. And then in between, you would have a little strip of cells and platelets located there. In the laboratory, they call this the Buffy coat. That Buffy coat, I don't know where they came up with that name, but that's what they call it. That contains your leukocytes and then also your platelets. And if you notice here on this diagram, uh, the leukocytes are your white blood cells and your platelets. They only make up about 1% of the components of whole blood. So they're not a huge component of your bloodstream, but they play very, very important roles. All right, and so I'm going to introduce the different kinds of leukocytes or white blood cells to you today. Um, not going to go into a lot of nitty-gritty details because we'll learn more about these cells when we discuss the immune system in this class. And then you'll also hear even more about them when you take uh, general microbiology, Bio 220, where you go into the immune system in a little bit more depth. Okay, now this picture on this slide, this is an image um, taken of a view of stained blood cells being viewed under a microscope. And so you may very well uh, look at these cells during the laboratory component of Unit 1. Um, and when you do, you will notice when you look at blood microscopically, the vast majority of what you're going to see on the slide are these guys. Those are your erythrocytes. That's another name for your red blood cells or RBCs. You will likely see scattered around lots of little specky things that look like this that are much smaller than those erythrocytes or red blood cells. Those are your platelets. We're not talking about those guys right now. Instead, we're going to be focusing in on these other larger cells that you see here. These are examples of different types of your white blood cells. So looking at this kind of typical smear of blood cells from, from some human who donated their blood, you'll notice there are a whole lot more erythrocytes or red blood cells present there than these example white blood cells. And these white blood cells have different names like neutrophils, lymphocytes, and monocytes, and so we'll talk a little bit about what those different white blood cells do. Um, notice they're not present in the same amounts. There are a lot fewer of them than you have red blood cells. And they're also typically larger than your average red blood cell as well. They have very different functions. Okay, so this diagram from your textbook, this is kind of a, a little diagram showing you what we were just looking at, the, the spun blood in a laboratory that's been separated into different components. Um, and if you took a look at the leukocytes or the white blood cells present there, now there are five different major types of white blood cells uh, or leukocytes that have different functions and they're present in different amounts or percentages. Most of us have likely had what's called a differential white blood cell count performed on us um, as a blood test at some point during our lifetimes and when that type of white blood cell count is performed what they're looking at is well, what percentage of out of all of your white blood cells that you have what percentage 
are neutrophils, what percentage are eosinophils, basophils, lymphocytes, and monocytes. Those are your five different types of white blood cells that we're going to be learning about. These percentages that you see over here are the percentages of all of your white blood cells that you would expect to be um, these different types. So the majority of your white blood cells are going to be either neutrophils or lymphocytes. They make up the biggest percentages and then you have typically have much fewer eosinophils, basophils, and monocytes. And you'll see that in the laboratory if you actually wind up doing this experiment. Okay, this diagram is, you've probably seen this a little bit before already. This is a diagram of hematopoiesis, which by now you have learned means blood cell formation. You have hopefully learned by now that all of your blood cells originate or develop in the bone marrow and they all develop from a common type of stem cell, which is an immature, unspecialized blood cell called a hemocytoblast. So all of your blood cells, red blood cells, uh, white blood cells, all those different types, plus your platelets are derived from these hemocytoblasts that are present in your bone marrow. As these types of cells divide over and over again, by mitosis, some of them specialize and become red blood cells. Some will ultimately specialize and develop into platelets. And then finally, some of them are going to specialize and take on the roles of these different types of white blood cells. And we're not gonna go through the details of this diagram, but if you look at the bottom of this fairly complicated diagram, you'll see here are your eosinophils, here are your basophils, here are your neutrophils, your monocytes, and your lymphocytes, which are your mature types of white blood cells. They all originate in the bone marrow from hemocytoblasts. They go through different stages as they mature into these different types of white blood cells. And you produce, typically, the, the percentages or the numbers of these different types of white blood cells that you actually need for your immune system to function properly. And all of that is very tightly controlled. It's very uh, coordinated in a very elegant manner depending on what your needs are. What is your immune system having to battle on this particular day in your body, assuming that you're healthy? Okay, so let's talk about these different types of white blood cells. I'm going to erase this for a minute. And two, one thing I want you to note here, these three types of white blood cells, your eosinophils, your basophils, and your neutrophils, they together are called granulocytes. Okay? And your monocytes and your lymphocytes those two types can be grouped together and referred to as agranulocytes. And I imagine you'll talk more about that in your Bio 202 laboratory. Uh, granulo is referring to granules, which are basically membrane-covered bags of chemicals that are important for immune system function. The granulocyte type white blood, white blood cells that you see here are, their cytoplasms are filled up with numerous granules that contain these very potent, powerful chemicals that are important for your immune system function. Uh, your agranulocytes don't have as many of those types of granules. You can't see them when you look at these types of cells under the microscope in a laboratory, whereas they're very noticeable when you look at the different types of granulocytes in the laboratory. Okay, so your granulocytes, as a group, your granulocytes include neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. They have very different functions 
and there are special stains that are used in the laboratory uh, that can be applied to blood cells that are present on a slide. Um, and the different types of white blood cells will pick up these stains in different ways. And that can allow you to identify these different types and count them and generate a white blood cell differential count if you need to know all those different percentages of these types of cells. Um, in general, these three types of cells are pretty large compared to red blood cells. They have one nucleus, but if you look here, the darker staining portions in these cells like you see here, that's the nucleus. It's one nucleus, but the nucleus can be lobed, which uh, the best analogy I can think of for that is kind of like one of those balloon animals where you have a, a long balloon and you twist it and it divides up into different sections or um, almost like a string of sausages. That's still one nucleus, but each little sausage or each little part of that balloon animal would be considered a lobe of the nucleus. That's a characteristic of these granulocytes. They have these kind of weird nuclei. Um, many of these cells are phagocytic, which means they can carry out phagocytosis. They can engulf things, especially microbes, bacteria, viruses, fungi, etc. cetera. Um, another characteristic that they possess is called diapedesis. And all diapedesis means, you'll hear more about diapedesis when you take microbiology as well. Okay, these are white blood cells that are traveling through your blood vessels. Let's say over here you have some type of tissue. Like it could be uh, the dermis of your skin. It could be the wall of an organ. And let's say that tissue is infected with some type of microorganism like bacteria. Well, if these cells are going to battle those microbes, they can't stay in your blood vessels. I mean, a lot of times when you have an infection, the microbes are not inside your blood vessels. They're in the tissues outside of those blood vessels. So these white blood cells have to be able to exit those blood vessels and get into those tissues so that they can do their jobs. That ability to squeeze through the walls of very small blood vessels is called diapedesis. Okay, so let's talk about these three different types of granulocytes in a little bit more detail. Uh, first of all, the, the neutrophils. Again, these are by far your most abundant type of white blood cell in a healthy individual. Um, this diagram, this is a really cool diagram I found on the internet. And uh, what this is showing you, this is a blood vessel here, a capillary, a very thin microscopic blood vessel. Those extend throughout um, almost all of your tissues. And in here, all of this is surrounding tissue that's being supplied with blood by this capillary. And these little brown things that you see here, those are supposed to be little tiny round shaped bacteria that are infecting this tissue. And this and this, those are both neutrophils that have undergone diapedesis. They've actually squeezed through slits that are located in the walls of these capillaries and they've entered these tissues and their job is to engulf phagocytose, ingest and digest these bacteria that are causing this infection. Okay, so that's actually, that brings up the main function of neutrophils. They're very good at phagocytosis. They're especially good at phagocytosing engulfing bacteria that are causing an infection. So sometimes they're called your bacteria slayers. They're also like first responders when you have an infection. They're gonna swarm in quickly um, and engulf bacteria that have infected some tissue in your body. Another name for these PMNs, that's an abbreviation for polymorphonuclear leukocyte. That's kind of a mouthful. Poly means many. Morpho refers to shape or structure. Nuclear refers to the nucleus. Um, and that gets back into these sort of odd-shaped nuclei with many lobes that these types of white blood cells have. So that's why they're given that alternative name, 
as well. They are granulocytes, so they have little membrane-covered packages inside them that are loaded with hydrolytic enzymes. So those are going to digest all of these different organic molecules that microbes are composed of. And also defensins, those are special proteins that are toxic for bacteria. You'll hear more about those when you take your uh, microbiology course. So neutrophils, very important. Think about those as uh, first responders. Think about them as being phagocytes that engulf bacteria especially. You have far fewer, under typical cases, of the second type of granulocyte called eosinophils. These are pretty rare. In fact, if you look at blood smears in the laboratory, you're probably going to get kind of stressed out thinking, hey, I can't find any of these eosinophils. Is this an eosinophil? I don't know. I'm not sure if I'm seeing one or not. And that's because they're rare. It's, it's, uh, you're going to encounter those much less frequently when you're looking at a blood sample from a patient, from a healthy patient. Um, under the microscope, they look a lot like neutrophils. Um, however, their cytoplasms are filled with larger granules, so little spots that you'll see in there tend to be larger. And again, those are membrane-covered vesicles or bags of chemicals that are important for the, the function of these cells. And also those granules take up um, a red dye that is used for staining these cells, and you may talk more about that in the laboratory. Um, what are these cells used for? Their role is pretty complex, but um, one of their main functions is to attack and digest parasitic worms. If you're unfortunate enough to have a parasitic worm infestation, this is one of their major roles. And in fact, this is an image of a microscopic parasitic worm. And you'll learn more about those when you take microbiology. But um, all these little round cells that you see here that are coating the outside of this worm, those are eosinophils that have attached to this worm and they are releasing all of those chemicals that are stored inside those little vesicles. And those are very, very toxic, um, very destructive, and they'll actually digest. The goal there is to try to kill this parasitic worm. So these are one of your, your best weapons against those types of invading organisms in the body if you're unfortunate enough to have a parasitic worm infestation. Uh, they also play roles in allergies. They also play roles in helping to ensure that your immune response does not get out of control. The, and we'll talk more about the immune system a little bit later in this unit. The third type of granulocyte is called a basophil. This is actually your rarest white blood cell. So if you look for these in the laboratory, you're really going to get frustrated because a lot of people won't find them. And hopefully your uh, instructor in the laboratory will um, alert the whole class that, hey, somebody found a basophil and you might want to come over and, and see one if you happen to find one. Um, kind of look like neutrophils under the microscope. Um, they're filled with little granules that contain important chemicals as well, but those tend to stain with a bluish dye, which is also called a basophilic dye in this case. Those granules contain um, several important chemicals, but probably the most important of those chemicals is called histamine. And uh, now we've all heard of histamine before, uh, or you've heard of that word before in the context of antihistamine, because those are drugs that we take to, uh, to help reduce symptoms of allergies. Histamine is a chemical that is released by basophils. Um, and also your mast cells that are present in your tissues. You hopefully talked a little bit about mast cells when you studied tissues and the integumentary system and 
in Biology 201. Histamine is a chemical that is released when you have an injury or an infection in a particular location. And what that does is it stimulates um, blood vessel dilation. And it also um, causes those blood vessels that dilate and expand in a tissue to become leakier so that things can exit the blood and get into a tissue where an infection is taking place. That's very important. We were just looking at diapedesis. These cells are in your bloodstream as well. They need to get out and into a tissue to help fight an infection. So if your blood vessels are expanded and the walls are leakier, makes it easier for these, these white blood cells of your immune system army to get out into those tissues and help fight an infection. So think about basophils as helping to stimulate inflammation, which also helps recruit in other white blood cells, other components of your immune system that you'll learn about later that are required to help you wage war with, uh, with infecting microorganisms. Okay, so those were your three types of granulocytes neutrophils, basophils, and eosinophils. Now let's briefly talk about your A granulocytes. So these are also white blood cells. They also are, originate in the bone marrow. You will, if you're a healthy individual, you will make appropriate amounts of these cells depending on your needs. But when you look at them under the microscope, like let's take a look at this one here. They'll have a very large prominent nucleus the cytoplasm, though, with the dyes that are used to make these cells more visible in the laboratory, the cytoplasm tends to have a sky blue type color, and you don't see the prominent, large, obvious granules. So because of that, these cells are called agranulocytes, meaning without granules. There are two major types of these, lymphocytes which are your second most abundant type of white blood cell in general. Um, and then you have your monocytes, which are not nearly as abundant as lymphocytes, but more abundant than your um, eosinophils or your basophils. All right, let's briefly talk about what these cells do. Lymphocytes, if you look at those in the laboratory under a microscope, they're pretty small, most of them. So this is a red blood cell, this is a red blood cell, this is a red blood cell. These guys are not a whole lot larger than those. They have a large round nucleus, very little cytoplasm. Let me erase that. Sometimes you'll maybe just see like a little crescent moon of sky blue. Um, lymphocytes are very, very important for immune system function, just like all of your white blood cells are. And more specifically, they are important for your adaptive immunity, which we'll learn more about later. That's the branch of your immune system that deals with very specific immune responses that you make to very, very specific types of microbes, very specific types of viruses or bacteria or fungi or whatever it is that you've been infected with. Lymphocytes are divided up into two major groups. Those are called your T cells and B cells, or your T lymphocytes and your B lymphocytes. Those terms refer to the, uh, the same things, and we'll learn more about the functions of T cells versus B cells when we talk about your, the immune system a little bit later in this unit. Um, these cells originate in the bone marrow. Uh, they tend to be pretty long-lived cells. Um, they tend to reside, yes, you have these cells in your bloodstream, but many of them under normal circumstances, they reside in your body, in your lymph nodes, your tonsils, if you still have them um, in your spleen. And then there are also are some other specialized tissues within your body that are sort of like your tonsils. 
that exist in places like your respiratory tract and especially down in your intestinal tract where these cells reside as well. Um, and we'll, we'll talk more about those when we go over the, uh, the immune system. Uh, your second type of agranulocyte are your monocytes. When you look at these in the laboratory under the microscope, these are big cells, generally. So red blood cell, red blood cell, red blood cell. Here's a much larger monocyte. Uh, monocytes also typically have a horseshoe-shaped nucleus surrounded by sky blue cytoplasm. Uh, about 3 to 8 percent of all of your white blood cells in a healthy patient will be monocytes. These are kind of interesting cells because, all right, let's say we've got a blood vessel here and here's a tissue over here and let's say this tissue is damaged and or you've got an infection going on. In your bloodstream, a monocyte is a monocyte. When they undergo diapedesis and get into tissues, they convert into cells that are called macrophages. And you may have talked about macrophages before in Biology 201. These are cells that uh, resemble amoebas. If you've ever seen an oozing single cell amoeba before, they resemble those. So they kind of ooze themselves around. They're capable of wandering through your tissues. Um, and what they'll do is they'll wander around in, in tissues that have been injured and or um, infected, and they are very good at phagocytosing or engulfing microbes, bacteria, viruses, yeast, you know, whatever you may be infected with. Um, they're also very good at phagocytosing or engulfing damaged tissues. So these are like your clean up your garbage disposals um, for injured tissues, dead cells, um, as well as microbes that you may be infected with. And in fact, that's what this image is over here. This is kind of a cool three-dimensional, um, highly enhanced image of a wandering macrophage. There's its nucleus. They do kind of ooze around and, and it is engulfing this little chain of round-shaped bacteria that you see here. So they'll ingest these and digest them and break them down into all their little corresponding parts. Okay, I'm going to stop this video lecture clip here and I'm going to start a new clip to talk about white blood cell formation and also in a little bit more detail and also uh, white blood cell disorders.